All right, guys, chapter 9 of Tortilla Flat. How Danny was ensnared by a vacuum cleaner and how Danny's friends rescued him. <clears throat> Dolores and Gracia Ramirez lived in her own little house on the upper edge of Tortilla Flat. She did housework for some of the ladies in Monterey and she belonged to the native daughters of the Golden West. She was not pretty, this lean face by Sana, but there was in her figure a certain voluptuousness of movement. There was in her voice a throatiness some men found indicative. Her eyes could burn behind a mist with the sleepy passion which those men to whom the flesh is important found attractive and downright inviting. In her brusque moments she was not desirable, but an amorous combination came about within her often enough so that she was called Sweets Ramirez on Tortilla Flat. It was a pleasant thing to see her when the breast in her was prowling, how she leaned over her front gate, how her voice purred drowsily, how her hips moved gently about, now pressing against the fence, now swelling back like a summer beach wave, and then pressing the fence again. Who in the world could put so much husky meaning into, Hey, amigo, a donde vas? It is true that ordinarily her voice was shrill, her face hard and sharp as a hatchet, her figure lumpy and her intention selfish. The softer self came into possession only once or twice a week and then ordinarily in the evening. When Sweets heard that Danny was an heir, she was glad for him. She dreamed of being his lady as did every other female on Tortilla Flat. In the evening she leaned over the front gate waiting for the time when he could pass by and fall into her trap, but for a long time her baited trap caught nothing but poor Indians and paisanos who owned no houses and whose clothes were sometimes fugitive from better wardrobes. Sweets was not content, her house was up the hill from Danny's house, in a direction he did not often take, Sweets could not go looking for him. She was a lady and her conduct was governed by very strict rules of propriety. If Danny should walk by now, if they should talk like the old friends they were, if he should come in for a social glass of wine and then if nature proved too strong and her feminine resistance too weak, there was no grave breach of propriety, but it was unthinkable to leave her web on the front gate. For many months of evenings she waited in vain and took such gifts as walked by in jeans, but there are only a limited number of pathways on Tortilla Flat. It was inevitable that Danny should sooner or later pass the gate of Dolores and Gracia Ramirez, and so he did. And all the time they had known each other, there had never been an occasion when it was more to Sweets' advantage to have him walk by, for, Dan for Danny had only that morning found a keg of copper shingle nails lost by the Central Supply Company. He had judged them jetsome because no member of the company was anywhere near. Danny removed the copper nails from the keg and put them in a sack. Then borrowing the pirate's wheelbarrow and the pirate to push it, he took his salvage to the Western Supply Company, where he sold the copper for three dollars, the keg he gave to the pirate. You can keep things in it, he said. That made the pirate very happy. And now Danny came down the hill, aimed with the fine accuracy toward the house of Torelli, and the three dollars were in his pocket. The lotus's voice sounded as huskily sweet as the drone of a bumblebee. Hey, amigo, a donde vas? A donde vas? Danny stopped. The revolution took place in his plans. How are you, sweets? What difference is it how I am? None of my friends are interested, she said archly, and her lips floated in a graceful and circular undulation. What do you mean, he demanded. Well, does my friend Danny ever come to see me? I'm here to see thee now, he said gallantly. She opened the gate a little. Wilt thou come in for a tiny glass of wine in friendship's name? Danny went into her house. What hast thou been doing in the forest, she cooed. Then he made an error. He told vaingloriously of his transaction up the hill, and he boasted of his three dollars. Of course I have only enough wine to fill two thimbles, she said. They sat in Sweets' kitchen and drank a glass of wine. In a little while, Danny assaulted her virtue with true gallantry and vigor. He found to his amazement and resistance out of all the proportion to her size and reputation. The ugly beast of lust was awakened in him. He was angry. Only when he was leaving was the way made clear to him. The husky voice said, Maybe you would like to come and see me this evening, Danny. Sweet's eyes swam in a mist of drowsy invitation. One has neighbors, she suggested with delicacy. Then he, met, then, uh, then he understood. I will come back, he promised. It was mid-afternoon. Danny walked down the street, re-aimed at Torelli's, and the beast in him had changed from a savage and snarling wolf and had become a great shaggy sentimental bear i will take the wine to that nice sweets he thought on the way down whom should he meet but pablo and pablo had two sticks of gum he gave one to danny and fell, fell into step 
Where goest thou? It is no time for friendship, Danny said tartly. First I go to buy a little wine and take to a lady. You may come with me and have one glass only. I am tired of buying wine for ladies only to have my friends drink it all up. Pablo agreed that such a practice was unendurable. For himself, he didn't want Danny's wine but only his companionship. They went to Torelli's and had a glass of wine out of the new bop gallon. Danny confessed that it was shabby treatment to give his friend only one little glass. Over Pablo's passionate protest, they had another. Ladies, Danny thought, should not drink too much wine. They were apt to become silly and besides, it dulled some of those senses one liked to find alert in a lady. They had a few more glasses. Half a gallon of wine was a bountiful present, especially as Danny was about to go down to buy another present. They measured down half a gallon and drank what was over. Then Danny hid the jug in the weeds in a ditch. I would like you to come with me to buy the present, Pablo, he said. Pablo knew the reason for the invitation. Half of it was a desire for Pablo's company and half was fear of leaving the wine while Pablo was at large. They walked with studied dignity and straightness down the hill to Monterey. Mr. Simon of Simon's Investment Jewelry and Loan Company welcomed them into his store. The name of the store defined the outward limits of the merchandise the company sold, for there were saxophones, radios, rifles, knives, fishing rods, and old coins on the counter, all second-hand but all really better than new because they were just well broken in. Something you would like to see, Mr. Simon asked. Yes, said Danny. The proprietor named over a tentative list and then stopped in the middle of a word for he saw that Danny was looking at a large aluminum vacuum cleaner. The dust bag was blue and yellow. Checks. The electric cord was long and black and slick. Mr. Simon went to it and rubbed it with his hand and stood off and admired it. Something in a vacuum cleaner, he asked. How much? For this one, $14. It was not a price so much as an endeavor to find out how much Danny had, and Danny wanted it for it was large and shiny. No woman of Tortilla Flat had one. In this moment he forgot there was no electricity on Tortilla Flat. He laid his two dollars on the counter and waited while the explosion took place. The fury, the rage, the sadness, the poverty, the ruin, the cheating. The Polish was invoked. The color of the, or the Polish was invoked. The color of the bag, the extra long cord, the value of the metal alone. And when it was all over, Danny went out carrying the vacuum cleaner. Often as a pasatiempo in the afternoon, Sweets brought out the vacuum cleaner and leaned it against the chair. While her friends looked on, she pushed it back and forth to show how easily it rolled, and she made a humming with her voice to imitate a motor. My friend is a rich man, she said. I think pretty soon there will be wires full of electricity coming right into the house. And then zip and zip and zip, and you have the house clean. Her friends tried to belittle the present, saying, It is too bad you can't run this machine. And I have always held that a broom and a dustpan properly used are more thorough. But their envy could do nothing against the vacuum. Through its possession, Sweets climbed to the peak of the social scale of Tortilla Flat. People who did not remember her name referred to her as that one with the sweeping machine. Often when her enemies passed the house, Sweets could be seen through the window pushing the cleaner back and forth, while a loud humming came from her throat. Indeed, after she had swept her house every day, she pushed the cleaner about on the theory that of course it would clean better with electricity but one could not have everything she excited envy in many houses her manner became dignified and gracious and she held her chin high as befitted one who had a sweeping machine in her conversation she included it ramon passed this morning while i was pushing the sweeping machine louise meter cut her hand this morning not three hours after i had been pushing the sweeping machine but in her elevation, she did not neglect Danny. Her voice growled with emotion when he was about. She swayed like a pine tree in the wind. And he spent every evening at the house of sweets. At first, his friends ignored his absence, for it is the right of every man to have these little affairs. But as the weeks went on, and as a rather violent domestic life began to make Danny listless and pale, his friends became convinced that sweets' gratitude for the sweeping machine was not to Danny's best physical interest. They were jealous of a situation that was holding his attention so long. Polona Pablo and Jesus Maria Cocoran in turn assaulted the nest of his affections during his absence, but Sweets, while she was sensible of the compliment, remained true to the man who had raised her position to such a gratifying level. She tried to keep the friendship for a future time of need, for she knew how fickle fortune is, but she stoutly refused to share with Danny's friends that which was dedicated for the time being to Danny. Wherefore the friends in despair organized a group formed for an Wherefore the friends in despair organized the group formed for and dedicated to her destruction. It may be that Danny deep in his soul was beginning to tire of Sweet's affection and the duty of attendance it demanded. If such a change were taking place, he did not admit it to himself. At three o'clock one afternoon, Bellona, Pablo, and Jesus Maria 
followed vaguely by Big Joe Portugui, returned triumphant from three quarters of a day of strenuous effort. Their campaign had called into play and taxed to the limit. The pitiless logic of Bilon, the artistic ingenuousness of Pablo and the gentleness and humanity of Jesus Maria Cocoran, Big Joe had contributed nothing. But now, like four hunters, they returned from the chase more happy because their victory had been a difficult one. And in Monterey, a poor puzzled Italian came gradually to the conviction that he had been swindled. Balone carried a gallon jug of wine concealed in a bundle of ivy. They marched joyfully into Danny's house and Balone set the gallon on the table. Danny, awakened out of a sound sleep, smiled quietly, got up from the bed and laid out the fruit jars. He poured the wine his four friends fell into chairs for it had been an exhausting day. They drank, quietly in the, they drank quietly in the late afternoon, that time of curious intermission. Nearly everyone in Tortilla Flat stops then and considers those things that have taken place in the day just past and thinks over the possibilities of the evening. There are many things to discuss in an afternoon. Cornelia Ruiz got a new man this morning, Pallone observed. He has a bald head. His name is Kilpatrick. Cornelia says her other man didn't come home three nights last week. She didn't like that. Cornelia is a woman who changes her mind too quickly, said Danny. He thought complacently of his own sure establishment built on the rock of the vacuum cleaner. Cornelia's father was worse, said Pablo. He cannot tell the truth. Once he borrowed a dollar from me, I have told Cornelia about it. She does nothing. Two of one blood. Know the breed and know the dog, Pilone quoted virtuously. Danny poured the jars full of wine again and the gallon was exhausted. He looked ruefully at it. Jesus Maria, that lover of the humanity, spoke up quietly. I saw Susie Francisco... Pallone? She said the recipe worked fine. She has been out riding with Charlie Guzman on his motorcycle three times. The first two times she gave him the love medicine and made him sick. She thought it was no good, but now Susie says you can have some cookies any time. What was in that potion, Paolo asked. Pallone became secretive. I cannot tell all of it. I guess it must have been the poison oak in it that made Charlie Guzman sick. The gallon of wine had gone too quickly. Each of the six friends was conscious of a thirst so sharp that it was a pain of desire. Pallone looked at his friends with drooped eyes and they looked back at him. The conspiracy was ready. Pallone cleared his throat. What hast thou done, Danny, to set the whole town laughing at thee? Danny looked worried. What do you mean? Pallone chuckled. It is said by many that you bought a sweeping machine for a lady and that machine will not work unless wires are put into the house. Those wires cost a great deal of money. Some people find this present very funny. Danny grew uncomfortable. That lady likes the sweeping machine, he said defensively. Why not? Pablo agreed. She has... Told some people that you have promised to put wires into her house so the sweeping machine will work. Danny looked even more perturbed. Did she say that? So I was told. Well, I will not, Danny cried. If I did not think it funny, I should be angry to hear my friend laughed at, Balone observed. What will, you, what will you do when she asks for those wires, Jesus Maria asked. I will tell her no, said Danny. Balone laughed. I wish I could be there. It is not such a simple thing to tell that lady no. Danny felt that his friends were turning against him. What shall I do, he asked helplessly. Malone gave the matter his grave consideration and brought his realism to bear on the subject. If that lady did not have the soupy machine, she would not want those wires, he said. The friends nodded in agreement. Therefore, Malone continued, the thing to do is to remove the sweeping machine. Oh, she wouldn't let me take it, Danny protested. Then we will help you, said Malone. I will take the machine and in return you can take the lady a present of a gallon of wine. She will not even know where the sweeping machine has gone. Some neighbor will see you take it. Oh no, said Pallone. You stay here, Danny. I will get the machine. Danny sighed with the relief that his problem was assumed by his good friends. There were a few things going on in Tortilla Flat that Pallone did not know. His mind made sharp little notes of everything that his eyes saw or his ears heard. He knew that sweets went to the store at 4.30 every afternoon. He depended upon this almost invariable habit to put his plan into effect. It is better that you do not know anything about it, he told Danny. In the yard, Pallone had a gunny sack in readiness. With his knife, he cut a generous branch from the rose bush and pushed it into the sack. At Sweets' house, he found her absent as he, had, as he had expected and hoped she would be. It is really Danny's machine, he told himself. It was a moment's work to enter the house, to put the vacuum cleaner in the sack and to arrange the rose branch artistically in the sack's mouth. As he came out of the yard, he met Sweets. Pallone took off his hat politely. I stepped in to pass the time, he said. Will you stop now, Pallone? No, I have business down in Monterey. It is late. Where do you go with this rosebush? A man of Monterey is to buy it. A very fine rosebush. See how strong it is? Stop in some other time, Pallone. He heard no cry of anger as he walked 
sedately down the street. Perhaps she will not miss it for a while, he thought. Half the problem was solved, but half was yet to be approached. What can Danny do with the sweeping machine? Malone asked himself, if he has it, Sweets will know he has taken it. Can I throw it away? No, for it is valuable. The thing to do was to be get rid of it and, and still to reap the benefit of its value. Now the whole problem was solved, Balone headed down the hill toward Torelli's house. It was a large and shining vacuum cleaner. When Balone came again up the hill, he had a gallon of wine in each hand. The friends received him in silence when he entered Danny's house. He set one jug on the table and the other on the floor. I have brought you a present to take to the lady, he told Danny, and here was a little wine for us. They gathered happily for their thirst was a raging fire. When the first gallon was far gone, Balone held his glass to the candlelight and looked through it. Things that happen are of no importance, he said, but from everything that happens, there is a lesson to be learned. By this we learn that a present, especially to a lady, should have no quality that will, that will require a further present. Also we learn that it is sinful to give presents of too great value, for they may excite greed. The first gallon was gone. The friends looked at Danny to see how he felt about it. He had been very quiet, but now he saw that his friends were waiting on him. The lady was lively, he said judiciously. That lady had a very sympathetic nature, but God damn it, he said, I'm sick of it. He went to the second jug and drew the cork. The pirate, sitting in the corner among his dogs, smiled to himself and whispered in admiration. God damn it, I'm sick of it. That, thought the pirate, was very fine. They had not more than half finished the second jug. Indeed, they had sung only two songs when young Johnny Pom Pom came in. I was at Torelli's, Johnny said. Oh, that Torelli is mad. He is shouting. He is beating on the table with his fists. The friends looked up with mild interest. Something has happened. It is probable Torelli deserves it. It is probable Torelli deserves it. Often he has refused his good customers a little glass of wine. What is the matter with Torelli, Paolo asked. Johnny Pom Pom accepted a jar of wine. Torelli says he bought a sweeping machine for Pallone, and when he hooked it up with the, when he hooked it up to his light wire, it would not work, so we looked on the inside and had no motor. He says he will kill Pallone. <laughs> Pallone looked shocked. I did not know this machine was a fault. I did not know this machine was at fault, he said, but I did not say Torelli deserved what was the matter with him. That machine was worth three or four gallons of wine, but that miser Torelli would give no more than two. Danny still felt the glow of gratitude toward Pallone. He smacked his lips on his wine. This stuff of Torelli's is getting worse and worse, he said. At its best, it is swill the pigs leave. It is swill the pigs leave. But lady, it is so bad that Charlie Marsh even would not drink it. They all felt a little bit revenged on Torelli then. I think, said Danny, that we will buy our wine someplace else if Torelli does not look out. <laughs> so Pallone took the motor out. And they're all like, fuck Torelli. His wine is shit. He does people wrong sometimes. And uh, Danny says, I think, said Danny, that we will buy our wine someplace else if Torelli does not look out. They're kind of like threatening him to not take their business to him. That's just funny. <laughs> uh, funny, funny, funny. Peace.